see the La Paz. So if I come up here. So computers, even though uh, for us, all the computers that, that y'all probably dealt with, you don't understand uh, that your computer is a binary device, which is ones and zeros. But we only number system that hopefully we understand is one called the decimal number system. So we have, and, and PLCs deal with this more than probably any other computer that you'll get into using the binary and also hexadecimal and another system called octal. These are, uh, besides for decimal, these are three under, uh, three other uh, number systems that you'll run into. So we're going to start this. Like I said, this is in chapter chapter 3 in the textbook. So we'll look at the decimal number system. We'll explain scientific notation, but y'all probably understand that. We'll talk about exponents, bases, which is not in this. We'll look at integer numbers, fractional numbers, and what Alan Bradley uh, refers to as real numbers. Uh, um, uh, not Alan, we'll look at real numbers, what Alan Bradley refers to as flo floating point numbers. So we'll look at those. Describe the binary number system, convert binary to decimal, and vice versa. Perform binary math. We're going to, I'll look at this and I'll show you all that, but it's not really, really that important uh, because the, the, uh, the PLC, uh, we don't do it in this class, but if you take the PLC2 class, uh, which is advanced PLCs, then we'll actually get into what we can do with a computer. Uh, of course, we know uh, PLCs use a type of logic called ladder logic, and we talked about that a little bit. And it was adopted over from uh, what we call relay logic. Uh, and relays can't do math. Uh, but since a PLC is a computer, and computers can do math, then, of course, once we get into the higher level functions of the PLC, uh, these are things that we can't do with a with a with relays. So explain the hexadecimal number system. A lot of people call this hex, but it's not really uh, correct. Convert binary numbers to hexadecimal, and vice versa. Octal number system. Octal number system is still popular in uh, in program logic controllers. We don't see it much in actual computers. Uh, because of the skip, but uh, octal is just a way we can represent large binary numbers, and this was the first uh, number system uh, besides besides for decimal uh, that PLCs used, and these were the first ones that was basically used in computers, but they evolved from that, so PLCs have tried to kind of stay downwardly compatible when they come out, so there's not a big learning curve when you go from one, uh, when one uh, manufacturer's PLCs uh, to another manufacturer's PLCs, and also when you upgrade to the newest uh, system. So what we what we look at now, we're going well, like I said, we're going to start off with uh, with the first major application that Alan Bradley put out to program uh, with a high level language to program uh, program logic controllers, uh, which is RS Logic 500, which is still a very viable uh, system, and it's taught. But what we'll find out is. When we move over to, uh, if you take a PLC2, when we move over to RS Logic 5000, you'll just see it's almost exactly the same, almost, except uh, the way they they address. They address weird, but we'll look at that. Explain uh, the binary coded decimal number system. Uh, we'll also uh, you look at uh, binary coded decimal, or what we call BCD. Uh, we'll also look at the gray code, and we'll talk about enhanced ASCII. Uh, EBCDEC, uh, the, 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 uh, the book is wrong on the EBCDEC. Extended Binary Code for Digital Interface Computers, I think is what the acronym stands for. Uh, they don't give it right. Well, we'll look at Unicode, even though, uh, even though the book doesn't talk about Unicode. Uh, we're going to we're going to we're going to cover that because if you're going to deal with the internet or anything like that, you're going to have to understand Unicode. Uh, ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. This is still widely used in PLCs as far as sending actual text messages, uh, like the HMI panels or stuff like that. So a number a uh, numbers written above. So we call this the base, and this is a, a X bonus. And the bottom number, of course, is what we call the base. 
So this is the base. And then we raise, on expotus, we come up and we raise uh, the base to some power, right? So this would be a base 8 numbering system, or base 8 raised to the fifth power. And what the fifth power tells us to do is we come up here and we multiply 8 by itself 8 times. Now we don't do that much anymore because any scientific calculator gives you the ability to do exponents. But what we need to understand, the bottom number is called the base. And then what we raise that bottom number to is called the exponent. So we would say this is base 8, right? Okay. So uh, scientific notation, a way that scientists and engineers easily handle very large and very small numbers, written in the form of m times 10 raised to some power. So instead of putting out this number right here, which would be uh, point zero, by the way, uh, on, on uh, printed documents, especially doc, uh, technical documents, is we, we start a fractional number, it, uh, a fractional number, not, a, not, that's got a whole, whole, uh, whole number, uh, we start it off with a zero. And they do that, of course it would be hard to tell here, because uh, if you print material over time, the decimal point would, would actually disappear. So this is just a technique that I'll use. So instead of saying point zero 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 five six, uh, if we represented that using scientific notation, uh, what we do is we just start moving it to the, to the right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the first whole number. And that's usually where we stop uh, in scientific notation. Now, if you're in D.C. Uh, this semester, or I'm sorry, if you're in E.E.T. 100 this semester, or you've already had it, uh, we use what we call engineering notation. So scientific notation, you stop after the first, after you get to the first whole number. And then we say 5.6, and then times 10. And since we move to the right, uh, this will mean if you see minus exponent, point, exponents, it means you move, you, you move, you're moving to the right. If you see positive exponent, exponent, I need to put an error right here. Uh, if you see positive exponents, it means you're moving to the left. So instead of saying 1,000, I mean, sorry, uh, this is not right. One, two, three. That's did I get this number out of the book? So we'd move it over. We start over here, and we'd come over here, and we'd move it over until we get. Now we're moving this way. One, two, three, four, five. Since we moved to the left, then our exponent will be positive on the base 10, and we'd say 1.57. Now what this does, it gives us the ability to represent very large numbers with fewer fewer digits. Okay. Five or above and rounding, rule of rounding, and this, this gets problems. Rule of rounding. Five or above rounds up, else round down. Round the following number to two decimal points after converting sci to scientific notation. So we come over here we'd, and we move it one, two, three, four. Now we're through. We found our first decimal point. And if we're going to reference to two decimal points, you know, two decimal points, then we'd go 4.5, and then it says 6. Well, 6 rounds up, and we would look at this digit, too. If this was like a 4 or something, we'd look at this digit. And if it rounds up, then it's going to round this way. So we'd say 5 point, what, what did I say? 5.57 times 10 to the 4th. Whole numbers move to the left until one whole one whole number is left, and that's what we do with scientific notation. In engineering notation, we move in groups of threes. By the way, in PLCs, this these are what we call real numbers. Uh, this is what 500 calls a floating point number.
So these are the ones we use. Now, of course, what you learn in uh, in engineer notation, we move in groups of threes. So engineer notation, we don't have any deci, we don't even have any hexa. We do have kilo, mega, giga, and tera. So in engineer notation, we don't have de deci, we don't have centa, we do have milli, micro. Now notice they're moving in threes. Micro, nano, and pico. And this is about as far as we go with uh, with engineer notation. So engineering for, uh, engineering notation, a form of scientific no uh, notation where the decimal point is only moved in groups of threes. And well, you're going to use this if this is your first semester. Uh, you need to really get these down. And we abbreviate them. Uh, so if I had 1,000, we wouldn't say 1,000, we'd say 1 kilo or 1K. Notice this is supposed to be a, a lowercase k. Most people write it as an uppercase k. Uh, but, uh, and over here we use uh, micro. Is Since we've used milli, m, then micro we use the Greek character for micro. Decimal number system has 10 digits running from uh, using symbols 0 through 9. So all our, all our numbers in what we call the decimal number system are combinations of these 10 symbols. So we learn them and we, we call that a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Each digit value depends on the position of the digit within the number. That was my phone. I was going to say, whose phone is that? But that's my. Uh, the base of the number, also called the radix, uh, multipliers, uh, multipliers for the digits are numbers constructed of numbers. Uh, system 10 in decimal raised to the uh, appropriate power. So when we wrote down a number, 9,863, 63, 9,876, uh, you learn this is what you call units, and then you learn this is tens, and then you learn this is hundreds, and then you probably learn this is thousands. Run out of space. But in actuality, what it actually does is it the 9,876. So what this would be, in, this is the, and what we're going to look at this is this is not the way you learned it, but if you understand this, then basically you can almost understand any number system. Uh, we call this a base 10 number system because each one of these digits holds a weight of 10 raised to some power. So what we call units, this holds a weight of 10 raised to the 0 power. This holds a weight of 10 raised to the 1st power. This holds a weight of 10 squared. And this right here would be 10 cubed. And then it would be 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th. Now if we come over here and put a decimal point right there, which technically is referred to as the radix point, and we usually give the radix point the name of the base that it deals with. This would hold a weight of 10 to the minus 1, which is 1 tenth. This would hold a weight of the minus 2. This was 10 raised to the minus 3. And if we kept going over th this way, 10 to the minus 4, to the 5th, minus 6, minus 7, minus 8. So any number to the right of the decimal point holds a weight of a negative power exponent and the ones to the left of the radix point holds a weight of positive except for this one guy right here 
this is the unique guy uh, in that it 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 is not a power it's, it's zero and of course any number raised to the zero power you know you could come up here and and put a million out there and then raise it to the zero power and it would come up and be one so any number raised to the zero power is one so this would be one so if I was going to figure out the weights 7 raised to 10, any raised to the first power is itself. Of course, this would be hundreds, and then this right here would be thousands. So this would be 9, if I did what we call positional notation, this would be 9 times 1,000. And we do this in our head. We dealt with this number system so long uh, that we basically can do this in our head. I know the weight of the 8. I know... I know what it is. I know what 9,876 is. I don't even have to think about it because this is the number system that we dealt with all our life. But if you understand this, then you're going to understand any, you can make up a numbering system. When I was in college, uh, we made up a base 36 numbering system, but it followed the exact same format. Uh, no, it was a base 30, 46 because we used digits too. So here we go. So that would be 9. This would be 8 uh, times 10 to the second, which is 100, plus 7 uh, times 1. I mean, I'm sorry, 7 times 10 uh, plus, I'm running out of space, 6 times 1 plus... 1 times, now over here is the reciprocal of the powers over there. Reciprocal means 1 over, so this would be over 1 tenth plus 7, right, times 2 tenths or 1 fifth times plus 3 times 7, oh, I'm sorry, this is not 1 fifth, this is uh, 100, 1 hundredth, sorry, my brain went dead for a second, I said, that ain't right, Rich. Because we're doing decimals over here. So this would be 7 times 1 hundredth, and then plus 3 times 1 thousandth. But like I said, we look at this number and we see it. We don't have, we know this is 9,876.173, and we we don't even hardly think about what that what that is because, like I said, we've been doing math. We've been doing up with the decimal system uh, ever since we was in elementary school. And some of y'all actually start counting, you know, before you actually get into elementary school. Of course, now we have kindergarten. Uh, when I uh, went through school, <laughs> we didn't we wasn't required to go to kindergarten. So here's the ba here's the powers. Any number raised to zero power is one ten. So we call this tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousand, hundred thousands. That's probably the way uh, that you learned it when you were in school, and it probably uh, and you were probably never introduced to these bases. And this is why it's called a base ten because our, the base of all our exponent is ten. And of course, this would be one tenth, one hundredth, one thousandth, one ten thousandths, one one hundred thousandths, and we could, we could uh, we could keep going. To infinity and this is what I did I came up here and actually wrote it using this positional notation uh, that we looked at and then of course when we had all these together <laughs> well we should come up with the original number fractionals have uh, fractional weights that are negative powers of 10 so uh, 
this would be one tenth or point one. This would be one hundredth of point zero one, and this would be one thousandth, which would be point zero zero one. And then if we do the math and add it back up, we come up with the same fraction as we had before. Okay. Is everybody okay? Y'all sure are quiet. Any any comments on this yet? Are y'all out there? Somebody say something. Are we going to use engineering notation or is it mainly just scientific? This is just scientific. And like I said, uh, engineer notation is something that we use, and it's called engineer notation because you're in you're studying for a basic engineering field. Uh, we don't teach a lot of design, but we're going to have to represent very large numbers, and we want to do it with as few a characters as we can. Now, of course, any time we get into a scientific notation, of course, especially on the fractional portion, uh, we're going to start we're going to start rounding. And we, we, we call them real numbers, but sooner or later we can't carry numbers out to infinity, right? You understand that? Uh, so sooner or later, once we get into those fractional portions, we're going to have to start rounding somewhere. So engineering, po so scientific notation and engineering notation. Uh, so engineering no to notation is a form of scientific notation. But instead of moving in groups of one in that PowerPoint, the book doesn't cover all the things in between milli, micro, and all those guys, uh, because I guess because this is uh, this is basically an engineering technology. But the in engineering technology is just a form of scientific notation. Uh, and what we mean, but when we call when we say engineering notation, we mean we 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 move in groups of threes. So in in our field. We'll deal with engineering notation more than we'll deal with true, true, actually scientific notation, even in this class. So this right here, we wouldn't say, if I had this number right here, uh, we wouldn't say 0 .0002. We would start this moving over, 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, we're moving in groups of 6, so I'd go 1. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then when I went back to the chart, and you'll learn this as you go along, when I went back to the chart, if I move it six, then that would be micro. So what I would call this number right here, wherever it's at, I would say 200 micro. And then I would put the unit out here, whether it's micro volts or micro amps or micro ohms, which you're probably not going to see 200 micro ohms because that's basically zero ohms. But, uh, so th the only difference with engineer notation and scientific notation, in fact, engineer notation and scientific notation uh, is just a form of engineer notation, but we move in groups of threes. So we're going to deal with engineer notation even in this class. Real numbers have weights that are both positive and negative powers of tens. Uh, we have an integer portion. Of course, an integer is a whole number, and we have a fractional portion. So uh, in PLCs, we, we probably deal with integers more than we do fractions. Uh, but uh, we, we have to learn how to deal with those because we have fractional portions in real, real life. But like all our counters are going to be integers. So integers are numbers, whole numbers. They have no fractional, fractional portion. Uh, then we have uh, signed integers, which means they can go negative or positive. And then we have unsigned uh, integers, which would be, I think in math, you call those absolute values. But real numbers are going to be set up. They're going to have both a fractional and a integer portion. Uh, 500 refers to these as floating point numbers. Digits to the left of the decimal point represent integer numbers. Digit to the right of the decimal point represent fractional numbers. Uh, integer numbers, these are whole numbers. These are not real numbers. Have weights that are positive powers of tens. 
numbers that have no fractional component uh, can be positive or negative numbers, but their weights are going to be positive powers of tens. So zero is an integer number, but it holds a weight uh, where depending on where it's at in the number. Oh, okay. So integers. So in this class, except when we do uh, some of our worksheets, I think this will uh, allow us to do our first lab. Uh, uh, well, there's actually a couple labs we'll be able to do when we come in class. So right now we're going to plan on coming on coming in on class uh, on Wednesday. And we've moved the class, by the way, because uh, the lab up in uh, A building is set up so we can only have a total of nine students if we social distance. So this is one of those classes where we always worked in groups of twos. Uh, unless we had an odd number, then one person got well, work, work by themselves. So what we had to do is we've had to move the class over to the Ethel Hall building. And we're going to be in room H111. And we're going to decide or go ahead right now and try to plan on coming in. Uh, in fact, we'll, we, we have a test coming up on uh, on Wednesday. I've already put the uh, review out there. I don't know if anybody's gone out and looked at it or not. But it's up in the te inside the test and exams inside the review folder. And... Uh, well, what I realized, of course, is that since we basically skipped, uh, skipped the first day of class, this is one of those classes you have to re lecture, but we had so much confusion with the new new registration system, uh, trying to get registered, and then uh, uh, that, because uh, you have to register yourself now. I used to, we could put the schedule in. We can't do that anymore, uh, that uh, we had to. And then some classes are virtual, some classes are hybrid. When do you come into campus? What was going on? So we basically lost the class uh, there. So that's why we're, we, I moved the test until uh, to, to Wednesday. But we're going to come on campus, and we're going to look at a couple of labs. So one of them, we'll look at our PLC and figure out what PLC you're going to be working with. Uh, we have two that we'll be dealing with. We'll be dealing with a Micrologic uh, 1100, uh, which is what I call a hybrid PLC because you can expand it. And then some of y'all will be on the Micrologic 1000, which is a fixed PLC. And one lab is you're going to look at your PLC, and you're going to identify what's going on there, uh, how many inputs it has, how many outputs it has, and different types of information. Uh, and then also uh, we'll let y'all do the, uh, the lab on numbering systems, which I don't remember which number, number, number that was. Uh, Number system, a writing system for expressing numbers that is a mathematical notation representing numbers of a given set using digits or other symbols in consistent manners. And of course the number systems we're going to look at is decimal, which hopefully y'all understand decimal. And then we'll go into the binary number system and the octal number system. Uh, what we're going to do is, is we have Three number we have the two number systems uh, at the very very end is basically what we're going to do to represent large binary numbers. So later on when you get into uh, PLC two, uh, we'll learn about uh, compare instructions and mask and that kind of stuff, and uh, those are going to be in binary. Uh, but instead of us entering these big old long 16 16 bit numbers. 16-digit numbers, uh, we'll split that down into the octal or hexadecimal. Uh, uh, most PLCs let you enter your lot, your lot, your num binary numbers as hex or octal. And like I said, um, if you're on a compatible computer, uh, I'll show you where you can actually see where these big old hex binary numbers are actually uh, represented, but uh, it normally uses hexadecimal. Uh, fixed point numbers, numbers that have fixed radix or decimal points and the numbers digits move. Uh, numbers with a fractional portion uh, of the number is fixed. For example, money. So money is fixed. Uh, so we got a quote. We got a quote on a, on a piece of equipment and I forgot what it was. It was like 123.0. Nine three cents, which 
didn't make sense. So, uh, yeah, that was one of those weird things that came up there. But normally what we do is, uh, is this right here is fixed. Uh, so, uh, used to in the old days where they entered the digits, you would actually see it start on the left. And this is also true of microwaves. So microwaves use fixed digits. So, you know, if you come up here and, uh, uh, enter, uh, the number like 50 or 1.1 uh, one minute 30 seconds then it'll come over here and automatically keep uh, keep the decimal point in the same spot and those are fixed digits uh, f floating point numbers this is what uh, uh, Alan Bradley calls them numbers where the decimal point can be in any position of the number numbers where the fractional part of the number can vary so, so this is what RS Logic 500 calls uh, their their real numbers uh, they're going to call them floating point numbers. Uh, uh, so this is where it kind of varies a little bit. So RS Logic 5000, uh, they call them real numbers. And also Siemens, the Teal, Teal Portal programming applications, refer to these as real numbers. Uh, RS Logic 500 refers to them as floating point numbers. So the decimal number system, we've already, we've already looked at that. I've read it back. So uh, we have a big old large number. And we want to do like 5,680.93. Uh, then this would be 10 to the 0. This would be 10 to the 1st. This would be 10 to the 2nd. This would be 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2. And uh, this basically could go on to infinity. This would go on to what we call infinity, which never has been reached. And uh, so... So since they both go to infinity, I guess it's in a big old circle. I don't know. So, uh, and then we uh, then we could break that down. Of course, m most of y'all don't understand this, but this is very very important when we get into other bases. So base eight, uh, we'd say might, we might we might have five six four. Uh, and I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do just to make sure that uh, your brain doesn't translate this as a base ten number. Uh, I'm going to put, I'm going to subscript the bases as much as I can. Uh, so, but this means this was base eight, base 8 number. So, this is going to be 8 to the 0. This is going to be 8 to the 1st. And this is going to be 8 to the 2nd. So, what we have, by the way, and we will do this, but uh, what normally what I would give you when we came into this right here, and I wish I would have uh, uh, did this, uh, sent it out so y'all might have an opportunity to. But on the, on the, uh, oops. But under course uh, content, uh, there should be a... Uh, course reference material and then and when y'all come in Wednesday uh, I'll run this off and give it to you but you can run it off yourself if I can get it to open number system and powers And, of course, this is powers of twos. We'll look at this. And this is 16-bit uh, multiplication table, which we probably won't do here. But we'll also look at uh, hexadecimal. This is counting powers of 16s and powers of 8s. Uh, and we'll, dra we'll drop over here, uh, and I'm going to keep this up. So, and like I said, this will be a chart uh, that you'll be able to use on a test. Uh, base 2 is pretty easy, and we'll look at that. Uh, I can go pretty far in that, but uh, the processor in a computer or a PLC only understands the numbers and codes represented with binary. 
all images displayed by a computer or a series of dots that are either on or off. And we use three primary colors, by the way. We use red, green, blue, and black. Uh, if you notice, your screen is a, a black background. And we can turn those different little triads on. We call them a triad because red, green, blue. And then we combine them into a square that we refer to as a pixel. Uh, so a pixel is one or more triad. And then we control uh, the digits inside a triad. They're, they're all basically control the, the dots are controlled the same, uh, which is pretty interesting. Computer programs can process binary code in a series of dots that a computer uses to display images on screen. This means a computer can display binary numbers, can display binary numbers as binary, decimal, hexadecimal, or octal. So all, all your computer is doing is sending a code to your, uh, it's, it's basically sending a dot pattern uh, to your screen, and computers can process information. So there's no, this computer has no idea what a Y is. All it knows is it was told to sp display a character, and it turned on dots to display a, this character right here. All it knows is ones and zeros, and then we have a method of displaying representing characters with codes you know those codes when when it sees this code come in for a character uh, it pulls out a memory out of the out of the, out of the read-only memories on your video card the dot pattern to send to the screen to uh, to display these characters so everything the computer does is in the binary number system uh, this means a computer can display any base any character any symbol uh, as long as it's got that pattern in your in your display in your ROMs, so on the video card. So number systems used by PLCs. So of course we use decimal. This is the primary one we will use this semester. Thank goodness for you. Uh, when we get into, uh, but you need to understand these other ones, especially when we get into address and in that kind of stuff. So uh, the only digits we have in binary. So binary. All we have is two digit combinations, 0 and 1. And this is the primary number system of our computers. Even though they display stuff in decimal for us, and they display characters on the screen, and they display graphics on the screen, everything is represented by these 1s and zeros. Uh, of course, the most popular way of representing binary is by using voltage levels. So a 1 voltage level would be a 1, and usually 0 volts is a 0. Uh, octal, uh, these uses eight combinations, and what they did is they used the first eight combinations of the decimal number system. But there's no such thing as the number eight, uh, the digit eight, nine, uh, eight and nine in the octal number systems. So its digits run from zero to seven. So this gets kind of confusing. So if I write 536, by default, by default, you're going to see that as a decimal number. That's what's built into them. Uh, all, but I know it's not binary because it's got a 5, it's got a 6, and it's got a 3. But 5, 6, and 3, 5, 6, and 3 are legal in the decimal number system. 5, 6, and 3 are in the octal number system. And 5, 6, and 3 are legal digits in the hexadecimal number system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to put a little subscript down here. Uh, so that would mean that would be a hexadecimal number. And that's all the difference in the world, guys. But the, what's nice about octal and what's nice about uh, decimal is uh, so that's the same number in base 2. I did not think about it. If one, We'll do a smaller number, we'll convert these two numbers over, and we'll see they're exactly equal to each other. So what we use, what we use the octal number system, and what we use the hexadecimal number system is for in computers, is to represent very large binary numbers. So if I said 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and I didn't write it down, and I told y'all to write that down, just about everybody in the class would say, go back, go back, go back. But if I said five, uh, five, three, six, then everybody would write that number down. So what the computer does is it uses these higher level number systems 
to, to represent very large binary numbers. So it'll be less mistakes of us transferring it between between each other. So, so in our PLC, we have the ability to specify the number is binary or octal or hexadecimal. Advantage used by computers or digital devices to electronically transmit, store, and process information. Information binary is easy to electrically transmit and receive accurately, easy to electrically store for letter use, and each uh, easy to electronically perform math and logic. I don't know how that each got in there. There's no telling how many times I've taught this class. I never ever noticed that before. Uh, disadvantage. It requires a large number of digits to represent number uh, decimal numbers and codes. So it takes a lot of space. Uh, it takes a lot of memory bits to play around with binary, especially when we start representing numbers. Octal. Used by computers to represent large binary numbers with fewer digits. With the first higher level, was the first higher level, higher level number systems used by computers and PLCs to represent binary numbers and codes. So since it was the first, uh, these are still supported by most PLCs. Disadvantage, it's hard, it's hard for most humans to understand because right off the bat, we interpret it as a decimal number. Just by, because it has some of the same digits. Hexadecimal used to represent large binary numbers and codes with fewer digits than decimal or octal. Uh, after decimal, this is the most widely used number systems used by computers to represent binary numbers and codes. A disadvantage is hard for most humans to understand because now we're adding letters. <laughs> so I might have 5B9. Now right off the bat, uh, hopefully that's a B guys, that's not an 8. We know it's not binary. We know it's not decimal because there's no such thing as the decimal B digit. Uh, so we know it's, but it would be, it would be a uh, base 16. And then if I'm going to convert that to binary. And you notice once you learn the trick, you can go between these bases with very little fault. And uh, so that's why uh, in computers, this is the base. Uh, if I, I'm going to show you all the address and chart for this computer. And you'll see right off the bat, it's in, it's in base 16. Binary numbers has a base, also called a radix, of 2. The only two digits are 1 and 0. All binary numbers created from combinations of these two digits. So this is where it gets very, 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 very cumbersome. Uh, because if I was going to represent 100, so that's 100. If I was to convert this over, this is 100 in base 10. Over well, here it took three digits to represent. Over here it took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digits to represent the same number. So the biggest problem we have with binary is it's going to, since it only has two combinations per digit, it's going to take a lot of digits to represent uh, large binary numbers. A lot of digits. <laughs> uh, least significant bits. Uh, by the way, uh, let's see if I got this. So this is what we need to understand is number one is where we need to know, uh, we use binary so much that they decided to split it up into groups. So we call each digit, we call this a bit. And not, not a lot of people use this one, but we do it for X. We call a group of four, this is called a nibble. A group of eight, y'all probably heard this before, but you didn't know what it meant. A group of eight is a byte, B-Y-T-E. And then we have groups of 16. Uh, 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Uh, we call groups of 16, and this is where they get away from the eating. We call this a word. A group of uh, 32. Uh, in computers, we refer to this as a, a double word. In PLCs, uh, for some reason, they picked up the term long word. And then we have a group, a group of 64. Uh, in computers, we call this a quad word. And PLCs, they call this a double long word. So on our power chart, uh, I don't know if I go up to 64 to the 60, you see. I thought I left that in the background, up in the background, guys. I'll have to make sure I bring it back up. So I'll bring that back up. Anybody got any questions so far? So y'all probably heard bytes, you know. Usually memory memory in a computer is, is laid off in bytes. Uh, we used to say gigabytes and you say, you know, we didn't say gigawords. It's been, you know, we, we went from kilobytes. The first IBM PC that came out. Uh, could have a maximum of 64, 640 kilobytes of memory in it. Of course, there everything was text. Uh, now we're into gigabytes of memory, uh, and we're into terabytes of storage. But most of them don't call it gigabytes anymore. They call it gigs, which I don't like. And uh, tera, they don't call it terabytes. So I guess they call it teras. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's the primary storage unit. Uh, where we store information into uh, memory. Uh, so every memory address will hold a byte. Uh, but what the computer can do is come out and access it in multiple addresses, which is pretty pretty neat. So, uh, so bytes, bits, bytes, nibbles, words, double words or long words, uh, quad words or double long words. Uh, double long words is about as far as we go with uh, with uh, with PLCs uh, because after that uh, uh, it'll shift into uh, we'll talk about it when it shifts into uh, floating point numbers we'll talk about that and the, the range of the of the sign numbers we will talk about that in uh, in this class. Uh, because when we set up counters, we can set them up as negative or we can set them up as, uh, as positive. So let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll continue on. I'm going to try to get my camera working and I'm also going to bring up that powers chart that we can flip between uh, so we can show you all that. In fact, uh, y'all can probably do that. Nobody log out because I need to get row. So to convert this over, we have to figure out what the decimal equivalent is for each one of these powers of twos. Some of them are pretty easy. Uh, so right here, any number raised to the zero power is one. And two, the first. Any number raised to, okay, so any number raised to the first number is the base. And this would be four. This would be two times two times two, which would be eight. This would be 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which would be 16. Hopefully you notice what happens. We start with 1, 
and each number just doubles. So it would be 32, this would be 64, this would be 128, and this would be 256. So all we do is we just start with 1, and then we double, and this would be the decimal equivalent. Now if we did this in positional notation, we'll write down the digit, this would be 1 times 256. Well, any number times 1 is itself, so instead of writing 1 times 256, I'm just going to write down 256. This would be plus 0 times 128. Well, any number times 0 is 0, so I'm not going to worry about that. So what I'll do is I won't write down the decimal equivalent of the zeros. I'll just write down the decimal equivalent of the digits or the bits that have ones in them. So it would be 32, this would be 16, this would be 8, and then this would be 2. By the way, if I add an even number plus an even number, I will always get an even number. If I add an odd number plus an odd number, but notice there's no double odds in here, uh, I will get an even number. The only way I can get an odd number is when I add an even number to an odd number. So the only odd number we have in this chart right here is 2 to the 0. So if 2 to the 0 is a 1, then my decimal number is going to be odd. If 2 to the 0 is a 0, then my decimal number is going to be even. And that's a, that's a little, it don't mean, it don't mean if, uh, it doesn't mean if you convert it and get an even number, it's right. But if you convert it and get an odd number, you're definitely wrong. So add those up and see what we come up and get. So 256 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 2. First one to get it, just call it out. Is anybody out there? Yeah. So what we got? No more, no more. Okay. Three fourteen. Has has the ability of being right. It don't mean it's right, but I started off with an even binary number, and I came up with an even even decimal number. So it looks pretty good. And of course, this would be base ten. So these two numbers are equal to each other. They are actually equal to each other. So this equals, this is binary, this is base 2, and 314. Of course, we would like 314 because we understand that. A computer has no idea what 314 is. So when I hit, I hit the one key on my, on my, what, on, one key on my uh, computer keyboard, it sends a code into my program. And then the code interprets that as a binary one. So, uh, so good guys. Everybody okay? Anybody got any problems with that? No, I just say it's pretty amazing how they correlate. It is. And like I said, and, and we have to understand this. Now, this class right here, we're going to deal with decimal. But when we get into, if you do the advanced PLC class where we're going to move into ArchLogic 500, I mean 5000, uh, we're going to deal with compares, where I'm going to compare two numbers. And it's on the binary level, guys. So if I say compare this number to that number, uh, we're going to mask off bits or strip bits off or make sure bits are set. And we're going to do that uh, not in binary. We're going to do it in another number system because binary gets very, very cumbersome. I mean, good gracious. Uh, this is uh, only 314. When I look at this number, I think it's huge because what's in my brain, my, what's in my brain is decimal. So if I see all these numbers, I would come up here and try to, in my, my head, I would split this into this, you know, and I would say that's, you know, that's 100 million, 111,000, and, uh, right, and, and uh, 10. That's what our brain wants to see that at. But in actuality, it's only 314. Because each digit only has two combinations, so that means it's going to take more digits to represent the same number. Where in decimal, we can we can do ten combinations with each digit. So you can see hexadecimal, we can do sixteen combinations. So 
hexadecimal is actually going to be more efficient than base 10 if I knew how to deal with it, you know, if I knew how to do math and division and all that kind of stuff. Uh, luckily, we're not, going, we're not going to learn that, even though the book uh, talks about that. And I'll show you all how to do binary math. Uh, and it's real easy, and the circuits that do it are re is, is very simple, too, which is one big advantage of a uh, of binary, is that when we add binaries, we're only, digging with, we're only dealing with two combinations, you know, either 0 and 1. <laughs> and we, instead of carrying on 10, we carry on 2, though, because we carry on the base. So how we're going to do this? We'll develop a table. So we'll write down we'll write down the decimal equivalent of the powers of twos. Okay, the decimal equivalent of the powers of twos. And of course, uh, what I have for you is I have uh, this chart right here, and I take you all the way up to two to the fortieth. <laughs> so you can see two to the sixty-four, and it would double every time. So I just carried it up to two to the fortieth. Uh, when a, 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 a double a double uh, a double long word or a quad word will get us all the way up to two to the sixty fourth, uh, which our calculators probably can't even represent that. So I had never seen a, a PLC uh, that gets over uh, over that. Uh, so I think I got my calculator down here. I should, yeah. So uh, 2 to the 64th, let's see if our calculator can do it. This calculator might, because it's got a ton of digits. Uh, most most uh, of your calculators uh, only cal they display 10 digits, but they calculate 13. So we'll, we'll use y to the x. We'll say 2 raised to the 64th power equals that. So PLCs... <laughs> They they basically give up on double long words, and we don't use that many double long words either because look at the size of that number. Good gracious! And like I said, your calculator would if your calculator would shift into engineer notation, a handheld calculator, because most handheld calculators will calculate 13 digits, so they'll round correctly, but they only display 10. So that means if it can't fit on 10, then it's going to jump in. It'll jump into scientific notation automatically. This calculator, I don't know how far we can go. But you can see it, there's really no need for us to even worry about anything above double long words uh, because that's a huge, that's a, that's a huge, huge, huge number. Well, actually, it's this many combinations. Uh, it would actually, the biggest number would be, would be a, would be a five over here. And we'll talk about that later on because zero, zero eats up one of your combinations. But still, I wouldn't even know how to say that number. Uh, anybody out there know how to say that? But uh, so double long words are great, guys. You know, uh, like I said, most of our stuff what we deal with is a, is a, this guy, which is 32 bits, which gives us up to four four billion. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, double long words are also also available on just about all your PLCs. They're not. It's not available on the Micrologic 1000, but it is available on the. Uh, not double long words. The biggest thing that's available on the uh, on the Allen Bradley on the eleven uh, hundreds is uh, is long words, which would get us up to this guy right there. If you're not if you're not using uh, floating point numbers. So, and it, oh, if we went on the other side, uh, by the way, when you uh, we have a lab. Normally, it's a homework lab, but we'll do this in class, the next class. So we're going to be in class on Wednesday, and we'll give you all an opportunity to do the number system lab. Uh, it it has some fractions in there, but if you convert the fraction over, I mean, I'm sorry, if you convert the whole number over, you'll get the answer. Uh, it'll just have a fraction out to it. But let's look at fractions. We need to understand that a little bit. I was going to ask you about those labs. Yeah, well, the, the homework labs, some of them you can do at home, some of them you can. And if you look at the lab procedures, uh, remember this was, this was, a, this was a built around in-class sessions. So if, if the homework labs are, are not critical, then what we'll do is we'll, uh, 
we'll just turn them in when you when we come into class when we're on hybrid classes. Uh, but that's probably okay. that's probably the way we'll work that one. But this one, I'll think mm -hmm. y'all I'll let y'all do it uh, when we get in here. We'll hopefully we'll start off in lab and then we'll uh, we'll do the test toward the end. Uh, you'll be able to use one of my computers here on campus. So, uh, in fact, for taking tests uh, on taking tests, you're gonna have to use one of my computers while we're on campus. Uh, so. Uh, so on Wednesday we need to go to Lawson and take the test. Yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to start off in lab. You're going to be on the Bessemer campus. We've moved the class into, because we didn't have enough room for lab over in A building, because that lab's set up to work in groups of twos. Uh, we're going to be in the Ethel Hall building in room H111, but you're going to enter in through H107 because you're going to have to figure out a, li you're going to have to uh, fill out a liability uh, form and then which you'll have to do one time and then you will have to uh, do an assessment form every every time we come on camp every time you come on campus you'll have to do one of those so we will be on campus Wednesday for class at 8:30 at 8:30 and y'all do y'all know where the hall building is you got to come in you you have to come in let me pause the lecture so if I was to come up here and, and we're, we're going to do a fractional number uh Oh, a three. There's no such thing as a three in a binary number system, Rich. <laughs> I'll get my act together in a minute. Yeah, it is. So this will be one, two, four, eight, sixteen. This would be one half, one fourth, one eighth, or point five, point two five, point one eight five. Might check that on me. I should know that. So one eighth is that point one eight five or point one six five? No, it's point one two five. There you go. I know I was close. <laughs> so what we would do on this one is what would we add together? We would add sixteen. We would add four. We would add one. Now some of y'all could do that in in your head. You know I can see that that's twenty one, and then I would add point uh, five. And point two five. Then I won't add point two five because it's got a zero. And then I'd add point one two five. So what would this be? This would be twenty one point six two five. And this would be the decimal equivalent of that. Now we're gonna we're not gonna deal with fractions. A lot in this class, but there's some of them on your worksheet, on your on your homework lab. But what you'll find out if you just convert the whole number, then don't worry about the fraction. This will be the right answer. So that's a little hint. So you can go through the whole process, but if you just convert the whole number to decimal, and then you'll see it over here. So I say 21, then one of your answer A would be like. 21.625 well the right answer is going to be a because all, if the whole number is right and it's the only whole number in there and it is uh, then don't worry about the fractions uh, we're just talking about the fractions like I said I won't put fractions on any test uh, the book does cover it so we'll cover it too and what I wanted you to see is that we can we can rep we can't rep we can represent any we can represent any any integer in binary fractions we're going to have to give up sooner or later because your 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 small this right here is one fifth where on decimal it's one tenth so uh, in decimal uh, in in set solid state 
uh, we will we deal with 0.7. <laughs> Convert that over to binary. So, I mean, it's, uh, so we can very easily jump into numbers, uh, fractional numbers that are just huge, uh, because of the resolution of the fractions. Uh, the, the decimal, the whole number portion of the decimal number, we can represent that in binary, any number. It's just that it might take a lot of bits. You know, uh, this is what we're talking about, the resolution. So here it took this many digits, uh, to represent 21. In decimal, it only took uh, it took uh, two digits to represent that same number. But remember, in decimal, we each digit has ten combinations. But in binary, each digit only has two. But think about binary. We can represent binary. All we need is something that has two combinations. Uh, the two the two most popular is of course uh, voltage. Uh, in digital, we use a lot of, uh, in digital, we use 5 volts. Uh, uh, but in PLCs, we're going to use 24 volts is going to equal a 1, approximately. And then 0 volts uh, would be equal a 0 from, from, from the input or the output point of view. Inside the PLC, I don't know what, what a 0 and a 1 is. Uh, if it's digital, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, if it's what we call TTL compatible, uh, then it's going to be zero and plus five volts. But it, we also have a tolerance. Uh, and here we won't get into much data sheets on the PLC. Uh, we talk more about that in other classes. Uh, but there is a tolerance. I think, uh, I think the input will accept anything above 20 volts. So it gives us a little, a little leeway. Uh, as far as line loss and that kind of stuff too, and plus uh, solid state sensors drop a vote too. So, so that's a little hit when you're doing your homework. Uh, if you convert decimal or binary to decimal, once you get the whole number, that's going to be the answer. All the rest of them will be out in the left field. And also, if you're going from decimal to binary, convert to decimal. And look up that pattern and don't worry about the fraction. And don't do the uh, converting decimal to binary. Uh, the book teaches the division method. Uh, to me, that's hard uh, because a lot of times you have to have a calculator. Uh, I, I can subtract without a calculator. So this is, we're going to teach this. But this is different methods. We, we did a, a certification. I got uh, certified in a Siemens PLCs are already certified in Allen Bradley PLCs and the guy that taught the class liked the division method. But what we're going to do is just going to draw a chart, subtract the largest pe uh, decimal equivalent of a power 2 from the number to be converted, write a 1 in the bit position of the power 2, subtract it, repeat step 1 with the answer of each subtraction until the subtraction produces a difference of 0. Place a zero in all remaining bit positions to the right. And we kind of do this as we go along. So we'll set up a chart. And we'll just do whole numbers uh, right now. So I'm going to go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Let's just say a number. Say I want 1,063. Well, right off the bat, I know, I know this bit right here is going to be set. I know 2 to the 0 is going to be set because it's an odd decimal number. So if I subtract down, and, and by the way, once you hit this bit right here, you should be, when you hit the bit or before you hit the bit, you should run, you should hit 0 somewhere down the line. If you still have stuff to subtract on this side right here and you're dealing with whole numbers, that means you did something wrong. Uh, what I like to do is I like to take my chart one past my number, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048. 1248, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. Okay, so where would we start one? What's the largest thing I could subtract from 1063? What's the largest I can subtract? The that, 1,024? 1,024. So I'm going to subtract 1,024. And what does that give me? 
And so you can do this without a calculator. What does that give me? I'm waiting. What is that? Uh, 39. 39. Okay. So I'd come up here, since I was able to subtract this, I would put a 1. Can I subtract a 512 from 39? Yes or no? Nope. No, so I put a 0 there. Can I subtract a 256 from 39? No. Put a 0 there. Can I subtract a 128? No. Can I subtract a 64? No. Can I subtract a 32? How many times? One. <laughs> I'm going to subtract 32. That leaves me 7. Can I subtract a 16? No. Can I subtract an 8 from 7? No. Can I subtract a 4 from 7? Yes. That leaves me a 3. Put a 1 right there. Can I subtract a 2? Of course, I would win it. Yes, I'd put a 1 right there. Gives me a 1. Can I subtract a 1? Yes, put a 1 right there, and that leaves me 0. So somewhere down the line, especially if you've got an even number, so this is my decimal equivalent. Double check my work. I'll add them, but I'll go the other way. So I'll say 1,024 plus 32 plus 7. And this should give me 163. Base 10. So these two numbers are exactly equal to each other. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a zero out there. This would give me 1,063 base 10. Those numbers are exactly equal. This is base 2. That's base 10. So what you're doing is you're looking at the same number in two, di two, two different bases. Now, of course, this is more convenient to us, but that's in base 10. Computer can't, doesn't know base 10. It appears to us that it does, but it don't. So if I enter 1,063 on my computer, somehow it's got to convert that over to binary before it can do math, before it can do logic, before it can do anything. Well, lucky a computer could do this for us. In fact, we got a calculator that can do this for us. Is cheating. You're not going to be able to use a calculator uh, on your test. That's why we're, one, another reason we're going to give it here is that. Uh, so most of your uh, most of your uh, so programmer's calculator. Uh, this is Windows. This is available on Windows. Windows 10 uh, calculator is even more impressive than this. This my computer still running Windows 7. So I can say, uh, I can come over here and put it in uh, decimal and enter 1,063. And then, this is binary, by the way. It's already, this is a binary already. And there it is right there. I can click that and it will give me the binary number. So there's a lot of things that help us out. And it tells us a quad word, so that's 64 bits, double word, word, and a byte. Now that makes that makes sense to us, uh, even on this calculator. But uh, but like I said, uh, in PLCs, they called it a, a long word and a double long word, which would get us up to a quad word. So 8 bits. 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits. So, and that's about as far as we, we need to go. But this calculator has no dip. But when I hit this key, that's just that's just the press of a button. And what did it do? Well, it gave the, the binary equivalent to the number 4. So uh, just by hitting a key. So, uh, and that's really neat. Uh, the keys on your computer are, are, are assigned by software. Uh, so if I hit the E key, I do not I do not get an E into my computer. I get a ones and zero code. It's called a key scan code. And I'll, I'll uh, show you all that, uh, which actually goes into the memory of the computer. And it could be, you know, we could represent the letter E or it could be exit or it could be if you if you play if you play video games on your computer, you can see that these keys are self-assigned, so you can, they can make that code mean anything uh, that they want it to mean, especially in video games. So if you're flying an airplane, when you hit F, uh, it might mean to lower the flaps, <laughs> you know, 
or G might mean lower the landing gear uh, because it's just a code and it's up to the application that's running in the computer at that instant to decide what those codes mean. Of course, if you're running Word, if you're running Word Perfect, uh, then uh, I'm not Word Perfect. If you're running Microsoft Word, uh, then that code for an F, that one zero zero zero, whatever it is, uh, it's going to print. It's going to print the pattern for an F up on your screen, uh, which is pretty neat. So it's hard to believe what's what's going on inside your computer just when you press the letter F on your keyboard. Uh, so the number one is not a one. It's a code that represents the number one. Uh, so it's a binary code. Uh, we call them key, can, uh, key scan codes. Uh, and if we understand ASCII code, which we'll look at uh, American Standard Code for Information Interchange, uh, you'll understand, which is used by most PLCs to send uh, characters up to up to a display, uh, like an HMI panel or some type of visual display. Uh, it must have taken them forever to write all that meticulous information. All the codes, yeah, and you, uh, what you have to remember, originally everything was done in a code called ASCII. And when I, when I, would, uh, when I would hit the letter F, uh, it would go into a ROM chip, and that F gave me an address. So the F represented on the address input of the ROM, and it would it would the output what what would be stored in that location would the bit be the bit pattern to display an F. So when computers first came out, uh, they were all binary. So you literally had to program them in binary. Uh, and then of course our first operating system, high level operating system, was called CPM, Control Program for Microprocessors. And uh, it was it, it was open technology. This is a true story, guys. And uh, uh, Bill Gates and Microsoft only wrote applications. When IBM decided to to uh, to build a personal computer, uh, they wanted they wanted I they wanted uh, they wanted Microsoft to also provide the operating system. Uh, there was an operating system out there uh, that was written by a guy at Digital Research called CPM, which was Control Programs for Microprocessors. It was open technology. Bill Gates got that, changed it a little bit, and sold it as DOS. So that's a true story. So and that, the less is history. So uh, so the guy that uh, at Digital Research uh, could have been uh, could have been Bill Gates. And Digital Digital Research is not even in business anymore. I forgot who bought them up, but they were a big mainframe uh, company for for years. But uh, true story. So, but yeah, it's amazing, but it's evolved. It's just like us. We, we evolve. The creatures evolve. And so what they do is they, they take what they got and then they build on to it. So it's been building up for years. Huh? Teams of people. Yeah. Yeah. It couldn't have been one guy. No, it wasn't one guy. It was basically to start off with Bill Gates wrote the first basic interpreter, which took a, which took a binary language, which took a, a high-level language like English and translated it over to uh, to binary uh, for the processor. So he was he wrote that wrote that uh, wrote that application itself. The uh, DOS was basically uh, he modified something that was free. So and that's when everything used to be free. Uh, so Bill Gates is the one that came up with the with the license agreement, by the way, because when he wrote dot, when he wrote, uh, I, I should pause this. This is some good stories, though. But when he wrote when he wrote basic, uh, he went to a computer store uh, show, and there was almost everybody else already had a copy of it there, because <laughs> everybody was sharing, and that's that's the way uh, it started off with. So uh, these end uh, user license agreements was also uh, created by Bill Gates too. So. Uh, yeah, that that upset him. So let's see if uh, let's see if uh, y'all can do one. So we won't use a number that big, so we don't want to eat up a lot of time. And then uh, the first one that gets the answer can just uh, holler it out. So I'm gonna race this, and then I'll come up here and take my pen back up. So let's do 592. So I know that bit zero or 
two uh, two to the zero power or one should be a zero. So you're you should subtract out to zero before you hit the the final bit. This is an even number, so my binary number should be even. And what's going to happen? Oops, move my mouse. Is that when I do this, this one down here that represent a weight of one or two to zero, you better have a zero right there. Because that, that determines if the binary number is even, and that determines if the binary number is odd. I'm going to pause the recording. Yell it out to me. We'll start off with the most significant digit, just like we would read a number. So I know it's going to be a one. <laughs> I'm waiting. Come on. Don't be scared. Mr. Corona, what you got? Uh, still working on it. Okay. Mr. Giovanni, you got anything? So you want us to say what comes after the first one? Yeah. Would it be zero zero one zero one zero 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 zero? Well, no. It has a chance of being right. Of course, this is a base two because that that number right there would be legal in base ten. The digits would be legal in base ten, so I'm gonna subscript them. Anybody got anything different? So since this is a zero, this is an even number, and this is an even binary number, it has a chance of being right. So what we would do to double check this is we'll come back and put our powers of twos. Since nobody else answered anything, let me do it in a different color so they show up a little better. One, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. 128, 256. So we're going to have 256 plus 32 plus 8. And if this comes up to be 512, then we're okay. No, there needs to be one more zero on the end so that it'll add 5. Plus okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what I got too. One yeah. more zero. So I just missed it. You probably called it out to me. I just missed it. Oops. So I have to do my I have to do re, redo my powers of twos. So we got another zero right here, right? And that's the yeah that's the problem we have binary numbers. Even calling them out, we can have problems, right? Computer loves it, but we don't. So this would be 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. So I had 512 plus 64 plus 16, and then that should add up to 192. that okay? Looks good to me. Good job. So anybody got any questions on this? So it's very, and like I said, and what's nice about this is that you can do this without a, without a calculator. Another method we could have done is the book teaches is divide by two. And every time you get a, a even number you drop the fraction every time you get an even answer uh, you would put a zero out there every time you got an odd answer you'd put or every time you get a fraction excuse me like a point five if you got a point five uh, you would put a one out if you got a point if, uh, if you got a whole number you'd put a zero out there so uh, that's the divide the division method this is the method I prefer uh, because you can do it without a calculator and you can see 
uh, once you get into step, you, you, it, it doesn't take long to learn these powers of twos. You know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 5, 12, 1,024, 2,048, 4,096, 8,192, 16,384. So you can see they'll, they'll just start rolling off. And y'all can tell I've been teaching binary a long time. So, uh, uh, and you'll learn the powers of twos, but y'all don't even know that because, like I said, uh, you'll be able um, on a test, you will be able to use uh, this chart right here. And of course, you just start with one and you just double it all the way down. I do pretty good up to here, and after that, it takes me a little while. So well, these numbers, uh, 2 to the 16th, uh, I pretty much well got these all the way from here to here. Not on that side over there. But above that, I would either uh, use a chart or use a calculator. So here we're doing 1,658. So we set up our chart. 1,658, and like I said, I like to go one pass to make sure I've got enough digits out there. Now, the biggest mistake people make is trying to subtract this number from that number. That's the biggest mistake I found. So, they'll see 2,048, and they'll, they'll subtract 1,658 from 2,048, and that's not the way it works. So these are the powers down here. These are the weights that we're subtracting from our main number. Okay. But that's the biggest mistake. I've seen that in almost any class that I've taught where people would come up here and they'd say 2048 minus 1658. And they would come up here and I'm going to kick that out because that's wrong. So what we do is we subtract the, power, the decimal equivalent of the powers of twos from the decimal number that we're trying to go from. So we're going from decimal to binary. From decimal to binary. So decimal's on top, binary's on the bottom. So 1,024, that would leave, that would leave 6,634. Uh, 600, uh, so I know I'm going to have a 1 right there. Okay. And then that'll leave 122. By the way, this, I'm, I started off with an even number. So I could, I could go ahead and put that right there right now because I know that's the only way I could come up with an odd number is if this right here is a zero, right? Uh, 256, I can't subtract a 256, so I know that's going to be a zero. Okay, there, then the biggest thing I could do is 64, so this, this is teaching it. Uh, then I could, uh, I'm sorry, I could subtract six, uh, I could subtract a 64, at least 58. I could subtract a 32, that leaves 26. Uh, I could subtract a 16, that leaves 10. I could subtract an 8, which would leave 2. Can't subtract a 4. Uh, can't, subtract a, can't subtract a 1. We've already got a 0. So what I do is I fill in 0. No matter where you subtract out. <laughs> so if I came up here and I wanted to convert 1,000, uh, if I wanted to convert 1,024, I would come over here and I would subtract 1,000. Well, you wouldn't have to do that. And I'd put a 1 there, and then I would come down through here, and I would fill the rest of these in with zeros. Uh, so I like to stick the zeros in while I'm, while I'm moving. Uh, but uh, this to teaches to add them after you get through, which is still fine. And that's what they're showing here. That says PowerPoint works. So this is the advantage of of of, de of binary over decimal. So this would be like me trying to represent nine combinations with different lights, or ten combinations. Okay. So what what is that number? 
What? What? Uh, can you show that again? I, I... Well, see, that's right. So this would be zero. This is this is black. This is black as my screen will be. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So what would that be? Man. Well, you're guessing. You're you're guessing at it. So you're guessing at it, and that's that's the problem we have, and this is the problem we have in computers trying to deal with the decimal number system, plus trying to send it from here to Europe, right? Trying to store it in in a, in, in in memory. Trying to store these ten combinations, even though we we could have one memory cell hold ten combinations. It would be almost impossible for me to uh, to represent those ten combinations. And we the analogy I use is like me over here on the hill. You're over here at the hall building, and I'm up here on the hill going up to A building. And I got a flashlight that's got ten combinations on it, and you're trying to get the numbers. Now this is binary, so that's zero. That's one. That's two. That's that would be three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Oops, my, my my number went off. So I would come up here, and I would come over here, and uh, for some reason my last digit. And let's say I turn on this one, and I turn on this one. Well, here you're not dealing with. Ten combinations on one digit. You're only dealing with one, guys. So now I can tell right off the bat that this is this would represent a decimal five, and I wouldn't even have to think about it. So I could go up there on the on the hill and spread out these lights and make it long enough, you know. And I could I, I could I somebody's got my, somebody turned on somebody's got their speaker on. Uh, so that's kind of confusing. But uh, see, that's that's the advantage of, of binary is that. We can very easily have the circuits that process the information are not complicated at all. Uh, I, I can show you a decimal adder. It's not much to it at all. It's only two devices that would add, that would add a bit. Uh, the circuits that do the math is very, very simple because all they're doing is adding zeros and ones. They're not, they're, they're not doing ten combinations. So binary math, if, if if we had learned the binary number system, math would have been a lot easier for us uh, than with the decimal number system, uh, and even even multiplication. Uh, you know, we multiply. Uh, if you understand binary addition, that's all multiplication is. So it, it, binary information, we can we, the circuits that we store it in are very very simple uh, because we're not trying to store ten combinations. All we're trying to do is store either a zero or a one. The circuits that do the math and the logic are very, very simple. Uh, instead of trying to do logic on, on, a, on a decimal number, you know, that would be very, very complicated. Sending it over great distances, uh, you know, if I, if I use voltage to send it over great distances, well, as soon as I say voltage and I'm trying to send it over distance, then all of a sudden voltage is going to create a current. Current is going to create a voltage drop. Uh, it's just like the battery in the flashlight. So that means I'll start off and you and you and you memorize all these different intensities and then I run that thing over and over and over and then what happens is I come in, you know, a month from now and and the brightness for a for a nine is now the same brightness for for a for a uh, uh you know, was the original the brightness for a six. So it's hard to maintain a, a precise voltage over distance. I hear y'all dinging, guys, but I can't see anything when I've got this shared. I'll jump over there real quick and see what's going on. Oh, so y'all can't hear me? Is everybody else okay? Can you hear me? Cause mine. Oh yeah. By the way, if you're if you can't hear me, 
and you're having problems with audio, you can click right here and you can use your phone for audio by clicking on that. Uh, this will give you a number and it'll give you a pin and then you can use your phone for audio. So 